Hey again, this video is a follow-up to the um, the one on Aristotle from earlier in the week, and what's happening here uh, this week is I'm attempting to move from you know a discussion of Aristotle straight up, where we're looking at uh, the first actual three chapters of his his book on rhetoric, um, pulling out some of the most important concepts, and then bouncing now into our contemporary moment to try to think about that question of utility, right? So I said, I think, in one of our earlier videos that for, for me, the, the whole kind of value of, of this class is not just learning a bunch of old ideas, but ultimately being able to do something with those old ideas and concepts and to see how they are operating today or not operating or need to be revised and so on. Um, and I came across this piece by um, Caddy Alford. She's an assistant professor of rhetoric, and I think she's in like an English kind of writing program. You find rhetoric scholars in de communication departments, but also in some English departments, um, which is a bit of a throwback to like 19th century uh, iterations of rhetoric as composition. Um, and she's got some really cool things to say about uh, rhetoric in thinking about composition and uh, the realm of the digital. Okay, so what I want to do here is just quickly return to Aristotle to, to cover one more concept called doxa, which I don't think we talked about in the last video, and then use that as a way to bridge up into our contemporary situation and talk a little bit about this business of the undiscussed, what's going on there, and then be thinking about what uh, Alfred is saying about choric invention. So... Just to draw your attention, I created one of those reading aids, RA. It says Alford Undiscussed RA, reading aid. So that's just my attempt to give you some help to get you through this reading, which it's on the shorter side, but it's also got some tricky kind of concepts, especially this business of Cora. So hopefully that's helpful. And then um, if you can you know, go through the reading, have the reading aid next to you, watch the video, you should, you should be okay, hopefully. Um, all right, so, you know, getting back to Aristotle, the, the core concept, of course, being the enthymeme. The enthymeme is a deductive form of reasoning that establishes a connection with an audience through shared assumptions. That's the kind of quickest way I can, can nail it. Um, so this business of assumptions, shared assumptions, gets us into this new additional concept of doxa, which is basically just opinion, all right? The point being that rhetoric does not deal with certainties. Rhetoric deals with opinions, probabilities, right? Opinions are probabilistic in the sense that they're not 100%. They're not based on, you know, perfect knowledge. They're half-formed, partially formed, you know. They could be somewhat right but incomplete. So an opinion is something that we, we all kind of have and carry around in us. But all kinds of things, you know. Favorite kind of ice cream, favorite movie, favorite city, favorite political candidate, you know, and so on and so on, right? That's the realm of doxa. Now, for Aristotle, enthymemes are tapping into more or less conscious ideas about arguments that are being made, right? But we can also talk about doxa in a more kind of broad base. Um, and if you watch that other video that I posted from the dude on YouTube where he talks about Mr. Rogers, he gets into the ethos, logos, pathos. But before that, he talks about this business of the elephant and the rider. Um, the rider being more like our conscious awareness of ideas. But then the elephant, which is most of us, is this realm that we're not necessarily completely always in touch with, right? This anticipates what Kenneth Burke said in the 20th century about rhetoric. Um, and the unconscious, he was a reader of Freud, and, and Kenneth Burke said that the unconscious matters for rhetoric in the sense that we can be persuaded, we can be influenced by things and not be fully aware of it. And we can tap into other people's unconscious and they not be fully aware of it. Think about, you know, if you're wearing a, when I was teaching this uh, earlier today in my class, there was a student wearing a UNLV baseball cap. And I just sort of pointed him out, like, imagine you were traveling wearing that cap and you were in a different part of the world or even a different part of the country where you wouldn't see that kind of thing. And sure enough, someone walks by with that same looking hat. Chances are you're going to like wave to each other or like acknowledge each other in somehow, you know, you're not necessarily consciously thinking, 
I like that person because we share the same rebel values, right? But on some level, you you, see, you sense a connection. That connection connection's enthymematic. It's just that it's below kind of the level of consciousness, but it's still operating in much the same way. This gets back to, this gets to Kenneth Burke's idea of identification, which is this idea that we connect on some basic level. We have, we're, we're operating on shared ground and oftentimes symbols and our belief in things based on symbols is what drives that, right? So like, oh, you're from Canada. I'm from Canada. Oh, you're from Ohio. I'm from Ohio. Right? Like all the other sort of assumptions that go with that kind of come into play and we we find these connections. These connections also kind of can serve as divisions, right? So if you're someone, I showed in class this funny clip from Curb Your Enthusiasm. I think I might have mentioned this where the main character, Larry David, discovers that if he puts on the MAGA hat, the Donald Trump Make America Great Act, great again hat in California where there's like so many liberals and progressives who can't stand Donald Trump, then people aren't going to want to have anything to do with you. So if you're someone who doesn't want to have anything to do with other people, just walk around wearing this MAGA hat and you're going to get like free seats at the sushi counter and no one's going to want to sit next to you. And if you want to like not have lunch with someone and he sits down, he's going to like just leave right away, right? So this is this whole business of identification and division, which is you align with with other with certain people and you unalign with other people. And this is all happening at the level of the unconscious and it's symbolic and it's anthemomatic, okay? And so to that realm of the, this author, um, Alfred, is going to talk about the undiscussed, right? So we don't necessarily talk about, like in that clip from Curb Your Enthusiasm, I'll try to post it on our webpage here to show you. We don't necessarily need to talk about our, our attitudes about that hat or our attitudes about Trump. It's undiscussed, right? It's already in there. We've had other conversations. We've had other experiences and so on that, that inform that reaction. But that, that whole um, sort of unconscious realm of assumptions and values and moods and so on, that's, that could be considered as doxa, the realm of, of the probable, the opinion, and so on. All right, so um, that's sort of where this piece begins, is this concept of doxa. The author wants to think about um, how it is that we engage in doxastic and thematic kind of persuasion in our kind of digital spaces, right? And for that, she brings in this other concept that um, you don't often find in like an undergraduate rhetoric class, but it's a business of Cora. It's a little bit of a tricky concept, but I think we can manage. Cora uh, has to do with a kind of a space. Uh, originally, it's space outside of Athens. Imagine like, you know, you have the city proper and then you have the space outside the city proper. So it's sort of an improper space or an alternative space. Um, and the whole point here is like to be able to talk about um, the, the sort of the, the combination of not just the space, but the bodies in the space, the ideas that emerge in this space, the technologies, anything that comes into this space that kind of erupts into some new other potential thing. So it's a space of transformation. It's a space of birth and growth and creativity and sort of eruption, right? Um, you can think of it sort of like the womb. And um, this is how the author wants to think about digital space or the networked, the idea that we're all networked all the time. It's like when we're networked, where are we? Where is the network? Where is the digital space that we're inhabiting? I asked my, my other students this and they were like, I don't know, everywhere? Like everyone has their phone, their computer in front of them. So they're connected in a digital space with other people all over the place, right? So how do you sort of conceptualize that? The author's coming up with this notion of Quora to talk about this kind of compressed space where things come together, bodies, ideas, technologies, right? Come together, sort of all smashed together, in, in this case, through the hashtag. Hashtags bring bodies and brains and ideas together, smashing them together to produce something new. So to the extent that we are dealing with a hashtag or some kind of digital composition, a meme, a message, whatever, to the extent that that, that rhetorical um, artifact is creating some transformation, some sense of moving from the given to the possible, that's the key element that we're talking about here. All right, so this business of doxa and related concept of commonplaces, we talked about topoi in the Aristotle video. Topoi is a place. All right. If it's a, a place you can go to make an argument, right? You can flatter someone. You can talk about uh, how much you love where someone came from. These are pretty reliable places of appeal. 
a commonplace is something that's so useful that it becomes sort of almost cliche, right? Like we were throwing some examples around in class about um, things that come out of the Bible, you know, like, um, um, you know, hate the sin, not the sinner. I don't know if that's an actual quote from the Bible, but like these these ideas that are so kind of reliably useful that they become common. That's a commonplace. You can invoke that whenever, wherever. It doesn't matter if you're in a forensic situation, judicial or, or epideictic or deliberative or whatever. Like you can draw on these commonplaces because they're common. Ten minutes. Okay. Okay. Um, so the whole idea of this kind of choric space of, of digital composition is when someone's hashtag, meme, rhetorical artifact that's moving through digital space is doing this movement away from the common or the given toward the uncommon or the possible. All right. So the author is going to give two examples of hashtags, one that is doing this choric invention and the other which is not. All right, and the key distinction, this is what I need you to all like write down and circle and underline and like star and it's like important. Not all hashtags are rhetorically inventive in the way that she wants to talk about it. Not all hashtags are. You can talk about hashtags as being rhetorical, but rhetorically inventive in, in the sense that they are producing something new. That's what she's interested in, right? So um, you can sort of make distinctions between hashtags that kind of just circulate for their own purposes and then hashtags that are trying to kind of push thought, expand thought, open up thought, create alternatives and so on. That's core convention for this author and I think it's pretty interesting. Um, so I've got my the reading aid here and I've got the, the reading itself. Just want to make sure I'm hitting the key stuff here. Um, yep, yep. The universe of the undiscussed is doxa. This is the realm of opinion. Um, oh, yeah, number four there. Doxa's richness comes through imagination. So imagination is what takes us from the given to the possible, right? Um, you can think about doxa of the given. We, today we were in class, we were talking about pit bulls, right? A lot of people have dogs. I used to have a pit bull with my ex. Um, and she really wanted to get a pit bull. And I was, I was kind of amused curious about this. Like her main reason for wanting to get a pit bull was to kind of like change everyone's minds. It's like everyone thinks pit bulls are so dangerous and scary. It's like they're so loving and loyal and family oriented and sweet and kind. I want to get a pit bull so I can show everyone. And I was like, okay. So we got Billy. Billy was cute. Part bulldog, I think as well. And super loyal and loving. But Billy went after she killed baby rabbits. She went after little kids in the park, you know. So it's like there's still that kind of quality of pet, of bulls, which they're bulls, right? And they, they can be unpredictable. But super do super adorable and sweet and all the rest of it. But I remember uh, my ex was like, was, was part of this kind of movement from like, I want to move people from given assumptions about pit bulls as dangerous to new, to new assumptions about pit bulls as loyal and loving and sweet and tender, right? Um, so that movement from the given to the possible is what we're talking about here. So you can think about opinions, doxa, that are that are kind of wired into assumptions about the way things just the way they are, right? There's a lot of things that we sort of assume we have opinions about, about the way things are, that may or may not be true. That's a little side thing that we got to remember here, is that opinions are just opinions. They can be wrong opinions. They can be incomplete opinions. They can be like patently false opinions, but they can still work rhetorically. And that's the thing that we're really trying to get good on here is how rhetoric can work powerfully, even in ways that we might not want it to, right? And that's sort of what we're dealing with here is like you can tap into opinions anthemomatically, good, bad, right, wrong, or whatever, and move people, right, just based on the very fact of that connection. All right, so imagination takes us from the given to the possible. That's that's pretty key. Um, to invent is to engage dogs. So, yep. Um, all right, so in terms of Cora, the Cora moment here, I think we've got uh, most of that initial stuff out of the way. It's a tricky concept. Let's not get too bogged down in sort of how she's talking about it, Plato and so on. There's different ways that she's phrasing this and characterizing this. The mother, the nurse of creation. Um, the Korra assumes a blob-like status, formless until it envelops something. That's the bottom of three. That's like, huh? What are you talking about? 
Um, the next page on four at the top says such invention occurs in a kind of inhabited moment. Um, a group think tank communally remembering, actively questioning, withdrawing, revising, receiving. The Coric Flash acts as the arena for everything that is subject to creation. And then she calls it a contact zone and so on. I think I'll, I'll link this example. I, I, um, I brought in an example in my other class today from the movie Pitch Perfect, um, which I thought was a really interesting example of this Cora. Right. So first of all, it's a space. Right. It's an actual kind of space of engagement. It's open. It's not like a closed off space or a predefined space. Don't forget, it sort of refers initially to the space outside of the city, sort of outside of the proper kind of designated order of things. So it's kind of an alternative space. Um, and it's where bodies, minds, ideas, technologies come together in this kind of contact zone, like an arena, sort of, I think one of the examples on here is like, think of, um, how a wave develops at a game in an arena, right? It's like somewhere there's this sort of like eruption of bodies and movements and so on. And there's this kind of core quality to that. It's this idea of transformation, creating something new out of, out of this collision of bodies, right? So the example from Pitch Perfect, this, this uh, movie that I adore, I have, I don't know if I've seen the third one yet. The second one's like, okay, the first one's great, second one's okay, the third one's supposed to be like not that great. Um, but I love them. I adore these movies. And uh, my favorite, favorite, favorite moment seen in all of these Pitch Perfect movies is in the first movie where what's going on is these are it's an a cappella group at a college, this all-women a cappella group. And at the beginning of the first movie, you know, this the, the Barton Bellas, they're called. And at the beginning, like, they've had a good run. They've won awards. But they're sort of just playing the same old tune. I saw the sign, right? And they do it in this acapella kind of way, and it's it's nice, but it's also, like, worn out. And so you can think about doxa of the given in this sense, right? It's like they're just sort of established. They're just kind of tired out assumptions, tired out opinions. This Bella Barton group, Barton Bella, whatever, <laughs> they've been singing the same old song. The audiences are tired. It's like, okay, here they go doing their thing, right? And that stops working for them at a certain point in the story, and they have a kind of a crisis where things go awry at a, at a competition, and, and it's this kind of moment of, like, how do we proceed? Like, what are we going to do here? So there's this kind of space within the story, this moment of, like, potential collapse, but also potential rebirth, and I love this kind of moment where it's like, all right, we got to do something. You can think about this in terms of Kairos, this idea of, like, an opportune moment. So in comes um, Becca... Anna Kendrick plays sort of the protagonist of the movie. She comes into this thing because her dad basically guilts her into it. Um, and she's got this whole kind of musical side gig going on where she mashes up songs using her computer. So you've got the given, the Bella, the Barton, Bella, Barton Bellas singing the same old tunes. Becca's been trying to get them to change their tune, but they won't. They resist it, right? We're going to keep doing it this way. This is what works for us. And then finally, when it stops working for them, Becca comes in and says, all right, please try this. And she, what she does is she takes them. It's an interesting space, too. It's like, I don't know if you've, if you've seen them, if you've ever thought about like where they go. They walk in, and they don't really comment on it. They're just walking into this like empty pool. And they go to this sort of like the deep end of this pool, this concrete kind of space, this non-space space, which I think is perfectly choric. Right, it's this kind of alternative space where they they attempt this new kind of sound, and so Becca's like, "Okay, we're gonna you know we're gonna do Bruno Mars, uh, just the way you are," and they start doing their thing, and then she starts kind of like layering in beats, and she starts singing this song, and she's doing this kind of mashup remix thing with her her acapella group, um, and it just erupts into this really powerful, beautiful sound, right? And after they're done, they're sort of like, oh my goodness, what just happened? That was incredible. And next thing we know, we're off and, and they've got a new sound and that's sort of what saves them in the end, right? But that choric moment of invention, of, dis of, of creation is super crucial. It's, to me, the choric kind of power of it is if you watch the movie for the first time, I believe that's the most like exciting moment in the movie where it's like they've discovered their sound, right? But what's interesting in terms of this reading is it, it really sort of patterns what she's talking about in terms of the given and the possible, right? You've got the given sound, you've got this kind of rupture, the space of like 
you know, reinvention, go, kind of going back and, and rethinking what we're doing here and then emerging as this kind of new thing, right? So all those dynamics are key for the way that Alfred is, uh, um, Alfred is talking about core convention, which is a transformation from the given to the possible, right? Um, so she gives two examples, starting on page six, two hashtag examples. The first one is if they gun me down, and the second one is, what is it, bring back our girls, I think. Um, so the first one she's citing, bring back our girls. The first example she is citing as a, a, a positive example of core convention, and the second one is a, not, a failed or you know not a good example of core convention. So the first one it has to do with um, the Missouri, uh, the Ferguson, Missouri uh, conflicts over you know cops and community members, and you know this is where um, Black Lives Matter got started and so on. So this is kind of about this is about race and criminality and how we think about others, right? Um, and the point of this hashtag, if you look on seven here, we got two images. And the point that Alfred is making about these images and the way that they're juxtaposed is not to say uh, young black men are not only thugs, as is sort of what looks like in the first, the left picture, and they're not only aspiring institutional white people, as is seen in the second one, but both of these images are sort of inadequate, right? Um, if they gun me down, which picture would they use, right? So the point that Alfred is making is that the juxtaposition of these two images is showing the very incompleteness of categorizing others in simplistic ways, right? So there's a kind of a movement that's happening through this juxtaposition. On page seven, below those images, she says, Dub J's tweets uh, reveals Doxa as resources whose generative potential gets activated by the fluid conditions of the digital resulting in core convention. I use the word kinetic here to invoke the constructive friction, a significant characteristic of quark invention. Constructive friction means sort of rubbing the given up with the possible, right? And so we got here two kind of different, let's say, doxastic, doxastic stereotype type images, right? The, the scary young black guy and the, you know, aspiring young black guy. And both of them are sort of reductive stereotypes. You can find these in sort of common assumptions. And at least what Alfred's saying about this, this image or these sets of images is that both of them are incomplete. Um, so it says at the end of that paragraph, the me in If They Gun Me Down already points to an identity that cannot be fully accounted for by either of these photos. So both of these photos are unsettling our assumptions and expectations about young black guys, right? And um, that's the point of it is to sort of unsettle our sense of the given. Um, and so that, that there's a kind of movement that's happening through this, this hashtag. It's, it's an attempt to try to push thought in a different direction to open up thought. Um, and that's what makes it inventively choric. Um, yeah, so the next page, page eight, at the end of that first paragraph at the top there, it says, the layout implies that the stereotype is much too flat to represent the complexities of an actual person. Both these images resist the stereotypes they are working with in order to suggest that identity is fluid, fluid for everyone. So it's not to say like that's the wrong image and this is the right image. It's to suggest that both of these images are, you know, like horrible reductions, stereotypes, right? And also doxa, opinions. These are opinions that people have, right? Both of them are incomplete. So the point is to to raise this question of the fluidity of identity and to, to, to get people to think beyond either of these images by bringing them in, in uh, contrast like that. Um, so it says in the very middle of that page eight, if they gun me down allows users to propose a new stereotype about identity actually taking place in the raw interstices between docs about race. The situation exemplifies core convention and practice precisely because it is the birth of a beginning occurring because of a momentary and emplaced concoction, the concoction of these words and these images in this digital space, a beginning that necessarily withdraws as the electrified material gets circulated and repurposed toward different effects. 
Um, and then she says in the beginning of the next paragraph, this tweet shows us that in the digital sphere, doxa are still our primary well for rhetorical invention. So this is the business of sort of like, how do we think about Aristotle today? She's saying doxa is still how we do what we do when we're online and composing um, tweets or hashtags or trying to kind of push out ideas. This is still rhetorical and it's still enthymematic. But it's enthymematic in this kind of broader sense of the undiscussed, of kind of cultural assumptions and attitudes about others. But it's still possible to connect with people in ways that invites them to think differently and to think more broadly. And that's the, that's the gist of the core convention. Um, yeah, so then the second uh, hashtag example, Bring Back Our Girls, is an example of a non-choric rhetorical invention. Um, Non-transformative, non um, boundary pushing, non-generative, right? This one, let's see, time-wise, 25, let's wrap it up. All right, so the point here is that the Bring Back Our Girls hashtag, um, she writes right a few lines below that, that section heading. She says, unfortunately, the hashtag campaign become a performative action, an example of therapeutic slacktivism that mostly serves to boost the user's ethos of goodwill. Another way of saying this is virtue signaling, right? So this is an example of a hashtag that doesn't ask users or viewers to kind of think differently. It doesn't push their thinking in any kind of way. All it does is it uses given assumptions about girls, our girls, is, is sort of the problem here, um, in order to circulate feigned concern in a way that sort of points back at the self and kind of gratifies the self, right? So as she writes on that sec that next page, page 10, um, the R bit evokes patriar patriarchal form of thinking that enacts possession over the girls, which is the form of thinking that ended up attracting attention to the Nigerian women. A few more lines down. In other words, the given works to prod users to project what is familiar to them onto the given's indefinite moment. What we're doing is we're just repeating old, tired assumptions about our girls needing to be protected and we must care for them. And even if we don't actually care, we just sort of pretend that we do. And so this is sort of empty, empty sentimentality that's not actually doing anything in terms of pushing thought or asking us to kind of reconsider things. Um, so she says that the beginning of that bottom paragraph on 10, while the example of this hashtag can actually cause change, this tweet merely seeks circulation through repetition. Um, there's a definite lack of bi stability in this example. So at the top of the next page, it's like the last key thing here, she says, thus if hashtags are to engender core convention that is generative and disruptive and oscillating, their doxa must clash with other elements, thereby dancing with the fluctuating conditions of digital spaces while carving out possibilities for invention. So for in order for a hashtag or some kind of digital composition to be considered choric, there needs to be that sense of pushing against something. So I asked you know, my class today for examples, and obviously Black Lives Matter came up, and Black Lives Matter, the very, the very, uh, existence of those words is pushing against the idea, of course, that black lives don't matter, right? So the, that's something that's doing this kind of pushing, this generative kind of thing is to get us to think differently, more broadly. You can tell that it's oppositional and resistant because it gave birth to that other responsive, sort of retroactive um, hashtag about blue lives matter, right? So that's how you know it was pushing against and, and giving rise to different kinds of alternative thoughts. So when, when we're in that space of pushing, of opposition, of getting, trying to get people to think differently, then we're in the realm of core convention. If a hashtag is circling just for its own kind of gratification, and if all arrows are pointing back to the self and the ego and easy sentimentality, if we're just falling back on old given assumptions, that's not choric, right? That's just sort of, um, she calls that social commerce. It's just kind of moving things just to get more likes and attention, right? So with that, we're already at the 30-minute mark. I was hoping to be a little bit quicker, but you know, some of these concepts require a little bit of elaboration. Hope you stuck in there. Um, this is, I think, a really interesting essay, and, and some of this stuff on this idea of transformation, of choric um, creation, and thinking about the space where that can happen. And, and, and it's a useful concept for thinking about digital space and digital engagement because it can kind of happen anywhere. But when we are sort of participating with hashtags, hashtag, of course, is like an index, it's like a spine that connects all the different users. Um, then we're in this kind of core space of engagement. And then the question becomes like, 
what arises out of that. And we can consider that all rhetorically inventive in that Aristotelian sense. All right, so there we go. That's Aristotle week. Um, next week, we have a holiday on Monday, and then we're doing um, Isocrates. I'm thinking about my other class where we have class in class. Uh, no class Monday, and then we're doing Isocrates on Wednesday, Wednesday. So we'll have a conversation about Isocrates, the last of the four models of rhetoric next week. Um, the paper assignment has been posted, and so you know that's what your main focus should be right now is getting good on the models and thinking through um, the video and the performance there. And I wish you well, and of course, reach out if you need to. So, have a good weekend.